Greetings, everyone. I hesitate to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we're across so many time zones. But I'd like to welcome you to our first conference on uh, the geopolitics and ecology of Himalayan waters. I'd like to uh, say a few things about how the initiative uh, began. In the summer of 2020, uh, a team of us at NYU Abu Dhabi and uh, decided to uh, launch this project under the Earth Humanities, because we felt that uh, so many things were happening in the particular region, in the Himalayan region, uh, that were being overshadowed by COVID. And uh, the geopolitical tensions had been growing in the past few months to an extent that we felt that it was now time to shed more light on what is happening uh, in the Himalayas. Uh, the climate crisis has led to what we've called the melting mountains. Uh, the geopolitical tensions are growing. There's a, a great securitization over uh, what is happening in the region. And ultimately, this will affect the water supply for over two and a half billion people. Thus, the uh, initiative was born and this, we are, we, we've been very lucky to uh, have the support of many, many people. And given that this is uh, a form of a launch, I will take a few minutes to thank uh, some of the people who've been uh, really uh, not only helpful, but have been instrumental in setting this forward. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank NYU Abu Dhabi. I couldn't imagine an institution that's more uh, welcoming and willing to really uh, invest in new research, in to give us a freedom to explore and open up new areas of discovery and agenda. And they have been, the as an institution, and all of the departments and the divisions have been very supportive of this project. I'd like to also thank uh, individually the former Dean of the Arts and Humanities, Taneli Kukonan and the current Dean, Awam Amka, for helping and supporting this initiative, as well as the Associate Deans, Sarah Paul and Jonathan Shannon. I'd also like to thank uh, Jesusita, Muhima and Tina from NYU Abu Dhabi, who've always been there for us and have helped us, as well as the IT that is supporting this webinar that's connecting us across the globe. Uh, the, when we launched this project, we weren't alone. We brought in a very important institution, which is the Rachel Carson Center of LMU Munich. And I'd like to personally thank Christoph Mach, who's always been very supportive of these kinds of collaborations with NYUAD. Thank the RCC and the Society of Fellows that have stepped up and have participated in this webinar itself, we have uh, a few people from the RCC uh, who have joined. My special thanks also to my colleague, Mark Swislaki, who uh, has been not only a good friend, but has also been uh, an inspiring collaborator. We've joined our forces as he heads global, the Global Asia Initiative at NYU Abu Dhabi to make this and other projects happen. And I thank Mark uh, from the bottom of my heart for all his support and uh, assistance. Also a big thank you to Carol Brandt uh, from Global Ed, who has opened our, uh, our, our ability, not only for us as scholars, but also for the students to research in what we consider the wider region around Abu Dhabi. And I especially thank her, not only for supporting us, but for also introducing me to Kunda Dixit, who has been uh, one of the first uh, people with whom, in fact, it was his own idea over the summer that we really turn our attention to this, to the region and to the problems as they are, as they are developing. So Kunda, who's the editor of the Nepali Times and teaches at NYU Abu Dhabi on climate, has been a great friend and a great collaborator throughout. Finally, none of this would have happened uh, without the support of former NYU Abu Dhabi students and current NYU Abu Dhabi students. I really like to thank people individually, but also say that 
Part of our objective is for this initiative to become a teaching lab. NYU Abu Dhabi has a very strong focus uh, on the student participation and involvement. And it's been a great joy to teach there for students who are over hundred countries who bring in all of these different global perspectives into the classroom and into the everyday life in a university. But also what I found tremendously important is that the students, even when they graduate, they still maintain the connection and they still act not only as ambassadors, but as sources of inspiration for us uh, moving forward. So I'd like to particularly thank Rastra, Hannah, and Ronak, who have already graduated, and yet their enthusiasm and their hard work has not only made, uh, has given not only visibility, but uh, real depth to this initiative. And they've taken care of absolutely everything we're doing because scholars are not renowned for being able to put any of this technical stuff together and to help with the, the networks of colleagues and friends. They've moved on to either graduate work or into the workforce working for different institutions and still they're coming back and giving uh, of themselves and of their um, interest to this initiative. I'd also like to thank Killian and so he, who are cur current students who are working with us and uh, they've been amazing. And also Pavan, who's working with us as a volunteer. Um, in closing, many thanks to Judy Shapiro, who is an expert on China and who embraced the project and the initiative from the very beginning. I'm really grateful for her participation. And uh, heartfelt thanks to my colleague at NYU Shanghai, uh, Ife Li, for being there from the very beginning and for helping organize one of the panels that you'll be able to um, experience tomorrow. Thank you to all the participants. I really look forward to this webinar. Please reach out to us with any suggestions for talks and ideas and further panel discussions. We will share uh, more programming as the year progresses. Please visit our website. And um, you can use the chat function for any questions that you have to submit. And uh, please keep us posted on any uh, ideas that you have, as I said, any kind of feedback. We'll be sending you more information along with our thank yous at the end of this uh, webinar. So without further ado, if you'd like to check out everyone's profile and all of the work that we've already done, because we have podcasts and features on our website, please visit it and you'll get more information. Thank you. Um, I hope that now the panelists will join us. And turn on their videos. We're waiting for Jayanta. While we're waiting for Jayanta to turn on his camera, I like uh, for each one of the panelists, you've had their CVs, you've had a description of, um, that tells you who they are, but I'd like people to introduce themselves briefly. So let's start with Deepak. Deepak, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm basically a researcher. Let me start simply with that, saying I study society technology interface and where things go wrong that way and where things go right this way. Okay, then let's go to Alex. Um, thanks, Sophia. Uh, it's wonderful to, to be here. Um, I'm a lecturer in international relations at the University of Western Australia. Uh, my research is on Indian foreign policy and international history, usually working from a post-colonial perspective, but I'm currently trying to incorporate ecological perspectives into this research as well. So I come at this from what we'd call critical international relations theory. And I'm also head of the Australian Himalaya Research Network. Fantastic. Jayanta, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, my name is uh, Jayanta Bandopadhyay. It is a uh, distorted uh, Sanskrit name. Uh, I have been uh, trained as an engineer, but I left traditional engineering and came to the area of Himalaya and its river systems long back, about 35 years back. 
and I was involved uh, single-handedly drafting the chapter on the mountains for Agenda 21. And since then, my basic research is on global mountains and uh, their rivers, but special focus is on the Himalaya. And uh, not necessarily Himalaya as seen from South Asia, uh, Himalaya as it is geologically formed and all round from the Yellow River all the way to Tarim. So it's a, it's a very interesting area if you consider the 10 river basins. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, my name is Ruth Gamble and I'm an environmental and cultural historian and I work at uh, La Trobe University in Melbourne in Australia. Uh, and mainly my work, I, I wrote one book that was basically about the sacred geography of the Himalaya and that got me interested in also the environmental history and I'm finishing up a book on the biography of the Yalung Tampo. Um, but in doing that, I've been um, all over the, in wetlands and swamps from the Yellow River to Ladakh, um, trying to find all this out. So um, yeah, uh, um, more bringing a historical perspective, but also um, many, many hours of muddy feet at this point. M many hours of having muddy feet at this point. Yes. <laughs> Sounds very enticing, especially now that we're all <laughs> with COVID. The, the images of somebody uh, doing that are incredible. Uh, I just want to say I can't remember because I jumped into this conversation. I'm Sofia Kalanzakos, <laughs> and I'm a professor of environmental studies and public policy at NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi. So let's just jump into this. First of all, when we talk about the Himalayas, even in defining what the region is I mean, are we thinking Mount Everest uh, with the snow-covered peaks of above thirty thousand feet that people have, uh, <laughs> been, you know, trying to climb? What do we think when we think about the regions, uh, when uh, the region itself? And is this really turning into a hotspot of geopolitics, or is this just another media construct to uh, to to show that you know to create? moments of tension in this region. Let's, uh, let's start with, I don't know, Deepak. Well, uh, <clears throat> it's more than a media construct. <laughs> it is a reality. There is tension. Uh, and that comes historically from the fact that uh, mountains have always been uh, uh, barriers to uh, the expansion of empires. And uh, most of the empires are centered on the plains. You see? So mountains have become like the limits to which these empires can go. And Himalayas have been an area where the, our great northern neighbor and our southern neighbor have collided. Uh, the problem for us who live in the mountains is that this is home for us. I mean, it's not the limit. It's not the margins, okay? And uh, uh, with the changing technologies, uh, uh, these, these boundaries are being called into question. Uh, you know, uh, from information, uh, you know, uh, from mm -hmm. all kinds of possibilities, uh, from aircraft travel, military aircraft, missiles, you name it. So it's no longer what it used to be when these nations and civilizations formed. And, uh, and therefore, that tension there in redefining all this. I think we are living through a time of redefinition. So redefinition of the region itself. Jayanta, when you've, you've actually helped create maps. Uh, could you tell us what you consider to be part of this wider region? Well, Himalaya is very different for different type of people. For a village woman collecting her daily biomass, it is a five kilometer circle within which her whole life in the Himalaya is spent. Uh, when in 1991, we tried to develop a map of the Himalaya, we had to go to the geological uh, linkage of the landmass. And whatever is the area which is affected by the tectonic process is Himalaya. So large part of the Tibet Autonomous region came in. Otherwise, from South Asia, we think that the Himalayan crest line is finally the Himalaya. Uh, there is a large amount of area, both to the east and west, as well as to the north of the crest line, that should be considered the geologically connected Himalaya. And uh, 
uh, I think also we should together with this new idea of the about 4.6 million square kilometer Himalaya, we should have the three inputs of water, which is the South Asian monsoon, the East Asian monsoon, and the westerlies, which come from the West Caspian Sea and others. They provide this vital water resource of the Himalaya. No one has calculated. I had tried some time. Is Himalaya the largest producer of fresh water in the world? Now, some data are not available. Himalayan data are always problematic to get uh, river flow data. But uh, I have the hunch that either it is the Andes or it is the Himalaya, which is uh, the largest manufacturer of fresh water in the world. And climate change is going to have a serious impact on this. Uh, in terms of people, obviously Himalaya 2.5 billion is a very, very remarkable uh, number of people, which might jump to 3 million by 2050. And uh, hence, the whole issue of hotspots. Now, we should not mix up with uh, hotspots with sensationalism. Neglected sensationalism may take uh, the whole attention into another area. I think the, the whole China-India divide of a small stream, Yalung Zangpo, downstream it is called Siang, has uh, drawn so much of attraction that it has started to become a hotspot. But in terms of the total volume of water, in terms of the economic value of the flow, I think uh, the hotspot is all round. And in particular, I take the uh, issue of the Indus Basin. It's a very hot spot. The, the Amudaria. Amudaria has become a hot spot because of the changes in the state structure. Soviet Union changed to independent countries. So Turkmenistan okay, so gets the water. So, so hot spots uh, are many. And I think Nepal, India uh, is a fantastic example of uh, potential hot spots. But in comparison to China, India, Nepal, India, uh, water management, water sharing has not drawn that attention. It's a fantastic area for new work, Nepal, India, so, water so, uh, relations. Okay, so you've given us a major uh, redefinition, I guess, for most people of the area and all of the different hotspots. So it's not one hotspot, it's multiple hotspots. Alex, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'd probably to, to take a sort of more geopolitical approach to it because that's my that's my background. Where when we talk about the Himalaya, we're talking about the uplands of China, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and that extends to places like Myanmar and Afghanistan. But we should also think about regions of the world that depend on it for water. So the plains of India and China, as well as the uplands and uh, and downstream into Southeast Asia. But it's also important not to just boil the region down into its states. So India and China are enormous and they have far, far more people living not in the Himalaya than, than actually living there. So that means that many Himalayan peoples are, have become minorities in their own lands. And I think that's an important part of the geopolitics here. So states are important, but we should also think of it as an incredibly diverse, um, ecologically distinct region that is defined by this intense verticality and snow, ice, water, high peaks, deep valleys and, and rivers. And to answer the second part of your question, yes, it's a hotspot of geopolitics as well, um, but it's a different kind of geopolitics. It's, it's an ecological and, and human form of geopolitics, geopolitics which, which requires a different kind of approach and analysis. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to unpack that because I, again, uh, it, it requires us to leave, I guess, our, our conventional IR thinking. We'll get back to that. But Ruth, could you also uh, chime in here? Yeah, there's a, a million Himalayas, it sounds like at the moment. And I was thinking that my, my understanding of it kind of comes from a different perspective again, um, because thinking about it historically and, and, and all the time, because I'm used to working in different languages, I can hear the different ways that people are saying it. So um, you know, Himalaya, the, the, the place of snow, and then Tibetan Kanchenjongpa, the, the land of snows. And this is kind of this uh, place that has evoked a lot of 
um, mysticism and uh, respect for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and then, so this is kind of like a cultural and ecological backdrop. And then over the past uh, 60 years, you've had um, China, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bhutan trying to figure out their borders in this region that really wasn't bordered um, before then. And, and, and yes, as Deepakji said, there's a, there was, the mountains were a border, but they were kind of a temporary, they were a seasonal border and they were a transitional border. They weren't somewhere where armies were batting against each other. Um, and, and this is something that's been happening in the last, as technology has gotten better, as people have been able to build roads, send in airplanes, do all of these things, then uh, you're getting these tensions, this infrastructural and uh, militaristic tensions along uh, these uh, snowy barriers, um, uh, so, which is creating hotspots. Um, and I was thinking every time you we were saying hotspot, I was like, well, oh, no, we don't want the Himalayas to get any hotter. Um, so, uh, so there's, there's these two elements to it, right? There's the kind of geopolitical tensions, but there's also this underpinning ecological um, coming disaster that, uh, you know, it, we really need everybody coming together, uh, all the different countries and, and with support from around the world uh, to try and face because, as Deontay said, there's a, um, this, this is a source of so much water and so much life for so many people. It's a, it's a, it's a international hotspot in that everybody should be paying attention to it. There's so, okay, I, I think <laughs> you've got me thinking now uh, so much about what is really happening on the ground and the way it's being framed in the global conversation. I mean, we've been witnessing the growing tensions between India and China in recent months. Uh, now the United States is also uh, being drawn in. Recently, the Secretary of State, recently, a couple of days ago, the Secretary of State visited India. And for the, for, for it's been a great departure actually uh, for Indian politics to sign uh, more of a defense collaboration and security collaboration with the United States. Um, so as the United States in, has really made China a focus uh, of tension, this is also securitizing the problems uh, that are taking place in this area even more. But the one thing that keeps missing is the real problem, which is the climate crisis which is leading to the mountains melting, which is going to create the water crisis, which is also exacerbating uh, the, uh, the problems between the various states who seek to continue to territorialize a region that is almost otherworldly, as Ruth has told us in previous conversations. So Deepak, tell us a little bit about the, the current tensions with even with this recent visit uh, it, but, goes further, it goes further back, actually. Uh, what we are seeing, uh, this signing by Mr. Pompeo and uh, the Indian uh, establishment, uh, it's only the tail end of uh, a process that's gone on for quite a while. And uh, to my mind, it's about uh, the redefinition of development as we have known it for the last 60 years or so, where uh, now it is no longer uh, development. It is more tied with security and other perceptions. And the, and the best uh, hotspot for that right now is the debate in Nepal that's not really covered internationally as well, which is the big fight over the br Chinese BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, versus mm -hmm. the American MCC, okay, the Millennium Challenge Cooperation, which basically sidelines USAID type of development and uh, you know, brings in uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy as a critical element of development. It's strange. It's about uh, building a 400 kilovolt transmission line, you know, which uh, you would have thought has really nothing to do. It's a pure development kind of a thing, but it's so strongly tied all the covenants and uh, things. It's a huge debate in Nepal right now. Uh, so it's, it's not just uh, China, India or India, US, China in that larger sense. Even development has got now completely securitized Okay, and uh, we are worried because uh, let me come back to what you just mentioned about climate change. Climate change really doesn't figure in any of this, unfortunately. It is a big problem. Uh, Nepal, the 200, 150, 200 kilometer width of Nepal has uh, from the 60 meter uh, above sea level plains up to the top of Mount Everest, we have every ecological zone in the world from tropical, subtropical, all the way to the Arctic. 
And between just these 200 kilometers live uh, 124 ethnic groups speaking about 103 languages, not dialects. Okay? And this is the diversity that we have. This is the diversity that depends on these ecological uh, you know, resources at various altitudes and all. Now with climate change, what is happening is everything is thrown into uncertainty. You know, we did a study way back 12 years ago before the Copenhagen conference, uh, where we had these various climate models look at just Nepal. Now that data is insufficient and all, but whatever data there was, took the global circulation models, about six of them, I believe. The report is available on the web. Uh, and what we found out is that what the models predict about temperature rise is fine. You backcast, you forecast. If you backcast works, the forecast probably works. But what was amazing was that the predictions on precipitation for Nepal Himalaya varied between the models from minus 53% less rainfall to plus 125% more rainfall. Now, if you're a politician, which one would you choose? You know, it depends on the day, you know, if there's too much scaremongering, you say, well, we'll get lots of water with climate change. Uh, if there's too much talk about floods, you say, well, tomorrow you're not going to have any water. So with the science, and this is, I'll conclude this part just with that, that one of the problems of Himalayan waters is that the, the, the whole study has been, um, in, a, in a disciplinary sense, hegemonized by two disciplines. In technical, by civil engineering, and much of it bad civil engineering, I would say. And on the social sciences by sort of a new liberal market kind of an economics, a bad economics, forgetting everything else. And, you know, meteorology, hydrogeology, uh, you know, aquatic biology, uh, you know, none of this really, you know, has fed into the water policy process, leading to a kind of a distortion in our development debate that the BRI versus MCC debate is just going to make far worse. Okay. So it's uh, so we have the questions of development, the climate crisis, uh, territorialization, Alex, and then I'm going to go to Jayanta. Alex? Yes, thank, I, I'd have to say that all the other panelists are probably better equipped to answer the question on, on climate change. But if I can just speak quickly to the, the issue that you raised with, with the US and India, there is a very long history of the US and Australia as well um, and the UK and Canada, this group of English speaking countries getting very excited about, about engaging with India. We think engaging with India is going to fix all of our problems. That's primarily geopolitical, but it's also to do with development. Um, this has gone on for decades and it has never borne fruit the way that we think it will. <laughs> and that's because India has such a strong discourse of um, strategic autonomy of these sort of afterlives of non-alignment. So Australia and India and the US don't seem to see the rise of China the same way. Uh, India wants to uh, create a multipolar world order. Australia and the US want to protect their hegemony over, over world order. So I, if China becomes assertive enough, it may lead to this sort of the US, Australia, India, the quad getting together, but I've long had my, my doubts over that actually, over that actually happening. Okay, Jayanta, what about the climate crisis? And why are we not focused so much on that? And we're focused on all these other, uh, the rattling of the sabers uh, between the major hegemons of the region and others who are coming in to assist this. What about yes, the climate? That should not be the case because the whole climate crisis in the Himalaya has a very special dimension of difficulty. Himalayan climate itself is not well understood. The climate process, forget about the climate change process, the climate process itself is not well understood. When, how the cloud bursts are happening, leading to floods. These are issues which have not been studied because data con sort of confidentiality, inability to go into the very, very uh, hostile areas, hostile in the sense of nature, not hostile in the sense of another army coming in. Uh, there is a data gap in high Himalaya. So data gap, knowledge gap, has created a tremendous problem in modeling for the what's going to happen as a result of climate change. But 
on the whole, there is going to be the, a similarity for all the climate models that has been applied is the precipitation is going to become more central. That means it is not distributed in the monsoon, but there will be more intense uh, rainfalls creating flash floods, which will reduce the overall availability of water and create more flood losses. Here, there is a reason for collaboration. I think the Yangtze and Brahmaputra has very similar problems of acute flooding and then water scarcity. You have a similarity of problem between the Yellow River and the Ganges, where pollution, industrialization, urbanization are uh, very similar. You have a similarity between Indus and Amudarya, where dry, uh, basically west, westerly fed uh, sort of snow and ice melt creates the flow. And then you have tremendous irrigational competition among the riparian uh, states, provinces, as well as the countries. So we have a, 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 a big task of forgetting about the sort of physical fights. There is an uh, emotional, professional, intellectual fight that has to be worked out in understanding climate change. We cannot avoid giving that importance, but we have to build everything from basically bottom because the database is poor, the knowledge base is poor, and uh, there is urgency to understand in the 20 years, 30 years, how the hydrograph of rivers, the precipitation patterns are going to change. So climate change is probably far more important as a hotspot than what uh, is considered as the sort of physical fights. So Ruth, I think now that we've heard, you know, different, different views on this, how would you sum it up? I mean, it seems self, it seems evident that what we should be focusing on is truly all of these other issues that, that um, in the, let's say this, um, the geopolitical discourse are, are peripheral, whereas they yeah. should be yeah, I keep thinking about, I, I read um, Deepak, I think it was Deepak's article where he said that water was um, an anarchist an, an anarchist element. Um, and, and I kept thinking that there's this basic tension here that we have an international order that is not fit for purpose in confronting the climate emergency. That's basically what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. right? We have, um, there is nothing in a nation state's interest necessarily, or a state's interest um, to uh, look after the rivers that leave its boundaries, right? It's, it, you know, even if you look at the, all of the models and all of the systems that um, China set up to manage its rivers, it's like it just disappears um, when it crosses the borders, right? And there's no, um, there's no system, there's no kind of uh, imperative to, to look after rivers beyond your, beyond your borders. So we've got these two different systems, you know, you've got the uh, hydrological systems that we were just hearing about that are quite extraordinary and complex and, and work through this, not just through the canals through which, or the channels through which rivers flow, but through the ground, through groundwater, um, in through weather patterns, through uh, snow and ice on the tops of mountains, this in, enormous system, like, the, like almost half the world's population depends on this massive water system, hydrological system that, that covers this region. And within it, we have these, we have nation states that are after looking after their own uh, securitization, their own territory and their own systems, and they don't match. They just don't match, right? And traditionally we had, I mean, I'm always fascinated by how um, on the Southern side of the Himalaya, that the uh, river systems kind of, um, fit with borders. So for example, like the Sikkim is the Tista Basin. Um, and then when the Ganga ends is where, where the Nepal is mostly all in the Ganga Basin. We, we had this idea of um, polities mapping onto river basins uh, traditionally, but we're not, we don't have that now. They're all kind of, um, it's wherever you can grab and wherever the borders are gonna, and, and, and again, I always, as I said before, I'm Irish, so I blame the British. They just, you know, put borders in where they don't really follow water basins. Um, so, so we end up with these tensions, tensions on border, border, border areas that don't 
fit with ecological reality, right? So nation states on one level, ecological reality, hydrological reality on the other, and they're not mapping together. Yes, it seems as if we're trying to um, have the suit fit, but it doesn't it quite doesn't fit. It doesn't quite fit. Um, <clears throat> but there's also a false dichotomy about how politicians can seem to understand uh, the interconnectedness of ecosystems. I mean, I wonder if it's really a lack of understanding because I do believe that politicians who are, you know, active on the ground, they have, they have every vested interest to understand the multiple, um, how would you say, the multiple uh, uh, stakes that different kinds of constituencies have in, um, as they go into the polls. So there is no politician who is not an expert on pretty much anything that concerns uh, the, the, re the region and the national. So I'm actually wondering, is it, I don't know if it's a question of understanding or if it's a question of complexity. It's so much easier to securitize it in uh, a military way than it is to bring in all of this nuance. What are your thoughts about this, Alex? Your mic is, you're muted, Alex. Okay, while we wait for Alex to unmute himself, I'll go to Deepak. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me pick up uh, and try to answer this question, something Ruth mentioned. I mean, yes, international boundaries, uh, um, I'm, I'm really sorry, my internet's dropping in and out. I didn't hear that question properly. Hold off. Hold off for the moment. We'll go to Deepak. I'll get back to you. Yeah, so it's within countries too. I mean, look at the water conflicts in India. Uh, you know, a Kaveri basin problem, even Ganga between Uttar Pradesh, Bihar. In Nepal, with the new federal structure that is still, you know, highly fluid, there's already enough tensions right now between provinces on water sharing already, you know. And the problem has to, uh, has to uh, this comes about uh, with politics uh, being uh, actually instantaneous. I won't even say short term, okay. Uh, uh, one good thing about politics and journalism, the two professions that, uh, you know, we deal with, uh, is that they're inherently interdisciplinary. Let's not forget that. Okay. that a politician and a journalist really cannot afford to say, oh, I only deal with economics or I only deal with engineering or uh, atmospheric physics or whatever. They have to deal with everything that comes. And uh, the failure of academia as such uh, has been, especially when it comes to things like water, is both in the failure of the natural sciences and the social sciences to feed into this policy process through what is called system science. We do too much reductionist science. We learn more and more about less and less and less, you know, but there's really no academic exercise really to put it all together, uh, synthesized for a policymaker to address. And that is, you know, it's done in very arcane academic environments and nobody reads those papers anyway. Okay. So but the, this process is missing, the system, system science process. Okay. Some countries are richer because they have the journalist class that's able to raise these, you know, linked up issues and bring it out into the public domain, you know, and in many countries that's not possible because the journal the journalism is not as free, shall we say, or you know, uh, developed. But even in countries that develop, like 1990s was the golden period of Nepali journalism. I'm sure Kunda will talk more about it, you know, when the turn comes. We could reach it. But uh, uh, right now, what has happened is there's also a shrinking of that journalism because it's got to be uh, started becoming more and more private sector, Rupert Murdoch kind of journalism, okay? And not really this activist journalism, the kind of journalism that brought in these activist voices onto the public platform. So the public platform has also shrunk to really address business issues, which means it's so easy now for politicians to take up a business concern and a political concern and bring them together, ignoring just about every other uh, issues. So that's a, that's a really important point. I'm going to get to Alex because he had an internet problem. I, I'm loving how we've moved into the virtual world and yet, you know, the internet can't even support it, but we're hoping, we're hoping for the best. Um, 
But I, I do want to say that, you know, and especially in academia, uh, there's so much discussion uh, about interdisciplinarity in, in breaking these silos and having uh, the disciplines connect and understand each other. Uh, the humanities, which are, I guess, shrinking more than perhaps other disciplines, are trying to find their, their voice uh, in, this, in this conversation. But even for, um, even though there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinarity, it's hard to achieve it. And one of the other things that I'm finding is, because I've, I've been a part of the policy world, uh, is that the academics can bring in a nuance that, policy, that the policy world does not have. The policy world wants to come out with uh, uh, easy prescriptions and academics perhaps over theorize. And then there, there is an attempt now to find a way to uh, bring some of the practicality, but also to enrich some of the policy solutions. Because as a, as a person who's worked in the policy world, but also has taught policy, I'm finding that there's a big discrepancy. And I think that this is something that we can point out to uh, as the conversation comes along. I want to go to Jayanta here because he too has mentioned in previous conversations about uh, perhaps the problems of both media and academia in understanding or portraying or framing the particular issue in the Himalayas. What are your thoughts about that, Jayanta? Well, let, let me first say that uh, it is easy to tell that we are in the grips of a reductionist uh, framework of thinking especially in terms of water, probably in many other areas. But getting out of understanding small things and uh, providing a conceptual framework for understanding interrelated larger issues needs time, needs effort. And uh, that is not a process which is uh, uh, you, you, you put on a switch and it starts. So interdisciplinarization, whether it is in the Himalaya or in the reverse of the Himalaya or in the atmospheric uh, and landmass interaction in the Himalaya uh, are lacking, definitely. But that's not a uh, special difficulty. It is a part of the game and time will definitely be required for development of interdisciplinary knowledge. But I think the Himalayan countries must put in a lot of effort, money, support towards that interdisciplinarization. Here, the politician has to come in to support academicians to generate interdisciplinary concepts. Otherwise, is one or two or three independent individuals cannot change the whole perception so easily. So I think here, the media, the politician, uh, perspectives. They are all to be tuned and I hope the media people are listening and the policy people are listening that they have to push for interdisciplinarization as a high priority policy of their respective governments and then come to each other's uh, collaboration. Because what is happening in the Tarim Basin of China and what is happening in the multi-country basin of Abu Dhabi are very, very similar. And there is an immense scope of inter interaction of uh, the knowledge generated in the Tarim Basin of China and in the multi-country basin of uh, Abu Dhabi or even Indus. Similarly, there is a problem of uh, uh, floods and uh, nine months of water scarcity in Yangtze and Brahmaputra. And there is a scope for uh, interaction between the Chinese scientists and the uh, Bangladesh and Indian scientists. So I, I think the interdisciplinarization needs a push, a joint push of the media, the political uh, elements and the leadership, as well as the academia. Without that, uh, Himalayan problem is going to remain unsolved for even another few decades. Uh, very worrisome to hear. Uh, Alex, I just wanted to ask you, when we say interdisciplinarity and, and the IR frame, and how, how would that actually work? How would it, you know, 
if any politicians uh, or even media are listening, like this is all good in theory, but what are we really talking about? How could this work in, the, in this, geopolit this kind of understanding of the geopolitical world of the global order? Um, that's that's an excellent uh, question. I just, I just want to apologize for my internet dropping out because my, my wife was upstairs listening to this and I had to, to kick her off. I'm so, sorry Oops. about that. <laughs> um, so inter I completely agree with everything Jayanta said. Interdisciplinarity is really, really crucial in, in dealing with the kinds of problems that the, that the Himalaya is facing. Um, so to speak from my own disciplinary perspective, what I've, what I've argued and what I've written is that international relations scholars and analysts, whether they're in universities or in think tanks or in government, they tend to focus on things like war and conflict. That's what the discipline thinks it's about. So they tend to see the environment, in this case, the Himalayan watershed, as something that is secondary to security, as something that will produce security threats. This is the, this is the term that you used a couple of times already, uh, Sophia, securitization. Securitization is a concept from critical security studies, and it, it looks at how an object becomes seen as a threat to security. What needs to happen in terms of um, interdisciplinary research and that filtering into government and policy is, is desecuritization, is for to find ways to see the Himalayan watershed for for its ecology rather than as a resource to be tapped. Um, and that requires discussions like this one. It requires us to go out and try and talk to governments. It, it requires um, coming together across disciplines. And that is, that is extremely difficult to do. Um, how would it work in practice? Well, it really does just depend on having these kinds of conversations in the in the first place and then trying to feed that feed that information up um, I'm not sure I have a, a better answer for you at the moment it's too much of an enormous question I wish I it's did. An enormous, it is an enormous question Ruth um yeah no I wanted to add in some ways um, maybe one of the best ways to do is to get states to get the hell out of there you know what I mean and, and that and that actually was something that struck me I was thinking about the the, the way the there's a cop, and I don't have an answer for this, right? It's just something that I can see, is that you, you, the whole idea of the Himalaya and why it's so tricky is that it doesn't, the, the things don't map both ways, right? So you're dealing with massive issues like climate change and this massive hydrological uh, system that spans uh, this vast area of land. But you're also dealing with, as, as, as other panelists have said, really um, diverse uh, system, diverse cultures, diverse languages, diverse biological systems. You can have one dry valley and then the next one is, you know, it, for some reason it gets inundated with um, outburst floods every every uh, few months, right? So, um, and, and the people of the region have, have expressions for this. Like I know there's one that's like one valley, one language, uh, one llama, uh, one one weather system or one, one rains, right? So there's, it's a one, so one valley will experience something completely different to the next. Yeah, and, and this is in terms of science, it's in terms of culture, it's in terms of all of these things. So before these big states came in and set up their borders, those little pockets would operate in a kind of bespoke way. You know, um, they'd have like cultural systems and ecological systems uh, that operated within that little within that little framework of that one valley or what, and then they have trade networks across the area. But what we're trying to do now is come up with ways that big states can act with bespoke laws and it doesn't work, right? It, it's a really, really difficult balance to get. So, so in some ways, the way it would work would get the states out and have much more local autonomy on how you do this. But you can't have that if you have securitization. And then there's also the idea of, this is why I say it's a wicked problem, I don't have an answer, is that what you can have is like one area will do things for their own good. And, and not necessarily the people downstream from them. So you need to have this kind of balance with a, a bigger entity, making sure one group doesn't disadvantage others and then um, enough independence to be able to respond to localized issues that it can be very different from the very next valley. 
Yeah. So which is why the Himalaya breaks IR. It doesn't work. It's very, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right. So, you know, this is, these are all such an interesting, um, you know, directions that we're going in. But if I were to speak as a, a state, a, a government, a, I'd say the mountains are melting. I mean, forget everything else. The mountains are now melting. And we're going to have to make sure that we have water for billions of people. And each state has to worry about uh, managing these water resources because of agriculture, because of you know uh, the urban population. Um, how can we get out of this conversation? I mean, it's very unrealistic um, to give the reins. I'm now taking the position of like a state of, of government of the sovereign. Um, it's unrealistic to give this much responsibility and uh, for the management of such a huge problem to uh, small communities that had been dealing in a localized fashion with their own water needs and their own developmental needs. Um, you know, states are trying to think in a more big scale uh, how to redistribute these goods and in order to redistribute, they feel that they need to control. Is this, is, how can we, how can we make a like, how can we shift this conversation uh, so that it makes sense to the ears and the understandings of those making decisions, whether they're large institutions, uh, again, in global institutions, we have many actors, but we primarily have states that are participating. Uh, climate goals, uh, with their many actors who have, uh, uh, you know, goals that they need to fulfill, but again, states are, are the big representatives here. Deepak? Yeah. <clears throat> On the one hand, you have this local management of water, which is fair, has been fairly effective through the ages. But because of this globalized kind of development that we all entered into the last, well, 50, 70 years, uh, there's been huge concentrations of population and uh, the need to supply water to those po populations in big urban areas, you know, in the plains of India, in Kathmandu Valley and all that, uh, means that the state cannot any longer avoid that responsibility. That's the sad part of, of our, you know, fallout of bad development, you may call it as an environmentalist. That's what I do. But it's a reality. Now, I have argued that uh, one of the ways of getting out of this narrow, siloed kind of thinking of, you know, focusing only on blue waters and rivers, that's where water concentrates and everybody wants to get a, you know, share of that uh, concentrated water. Uh, but if you really look at water, uh, the issue is water storage. You know, we are, uh, South Asia is a semi-arid zone. You know, we are not rich in water resources. This is something we've had to hammer here in Nepal for the last 30 years and nobody's still listening, that we are rich only in four months of flood and eight months of drought. That's what we are rich in. And you can't average those two things and say we are rich in water resources, which is what our politics national politics has done over the last 50, 60 years. Okay? It's like putting a one foot in a hot stove and other inside a freezer and saying, on the average, I'm comfortable. Okay? Doesn't work that way. So what we have to do is a mental and academic jujutsu you know, to look at water in terms of its storage. How have communities stored water? How have states stored them behind large dams? You know, how has it been stored in groundwater that we are misusing, you know, unregulated and unchecked? You know, how have we destroyed our wetlands, which are a great storage of water? So there are multiple types of water storage okay, that we need to go back to, to try to solve our kind of problems right now. And traditionally, South Asia has been really good as a semi-arid zone in these water harvesting structures. If you look at those great structures of 700, 800 years ago, you know, in Delhi, in Rajasthan, in, in Nepal's Janakpur, the ponds technology in India, what are called baudis, uh, you know, these these are great structures that really trapped uh, and stored the monsoon water for the population uh, in the dry season. Now we have forgotten all that, and our academia has concentrated on the civil engineering of cement. That's all we have done okay, in the name of development. So I think there's a great need to solve this problem by a mental jujutsu, uh, academically and discipline wise, uh, to rethink development, rethink water. Well, this is, 
I love the image. I can just think of this mental jujitsu uh, taking place. And I think it's a great, great way of, of thinking. What do you think, Jayanta? Is it going to take such a, a difficult exercise in order to be able to understand what really is at stake and actually find solutions that are both just, equitable, and practical for what's about to happen? Yes, it, it's not a very easy uh, problem to solve. And uh, the, the macro is very much there. But finally, it is the micro where water is used and uh, food is produced or uh, security of energy at the smaller scale. So it, it's not a very easy task. And the linking today the macro to the micro is probably a, an intellectual uh, uh, sort of target for all professionals in the Himalaya. What I think uh, we can uh, benefit from is a Himalayan strategy for understanding climate. Because if the westerlies are changing the course, if the South Asian monsoon is coming late, or the East Asian monsoon is becoming more aggressive, it's going to affect many of the river basins, if not all 10. So there is a need for a Himalayan level climate action, climate change studies, global warming studies, because don't forget that uh, the Tibet is going to warm up at the rates three to four times the global. So if the global is uh, two degrees Celsius at the end of the century, Tibet is going to have six degrees or more at the end of the century. And the Himalaya on the whole is going to be very, very warmer. So the Himalayan transformation is going to be much quicker than the global transformation in terms of warming and climate change. So I think the macro process cannot be ignored and that macro process needs a collaborative process between all the countries who need to collaborate together. It is, it is Bangladesh, it is India, it is Nepal, it's Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, China, and of course, our, uh, the, the eight countries of the Central Asia who benefit from the Aral Sea area. So, I think there is a tremendous option, opportunity of uh, a hotspot, addressing a hotspot called Himalayan climate change and water future. If that can be a collaborative hotspot at, and attacking the hotspot is uh, quite possible with the existing scientific network in all the countries, that should be much more uh, useful at the micro to the macro level connection. So I, I, I just wanna say that this also responds to some of the questions I'm, in the chat box, I'm getting uh, different questions from the audience. And I guess this, is, this answers uh, one of the questions about how governments and what kinds of types of collaborations we need to see coming out of, out of the region. But um, I'd like to go to Ruth because there is also a question from the audience about the, um, the indigenous people and how they're being uh, marginalized in this conversation. Yeah. I mean, we're back into this big state conversation and the, uh, there's less, there's really less media focus. I think there might be more academic focus, but there's less, certainly less media focus and perhaps less, surely less state focus on the uh, indigenous populations. Yeah. and and. Uh, I mean, there's, there's 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 a few things that I think uh, could come from that. From that was um, there there's the variety is uh, one of the key things that doesn't get enough focus on, or it or can get lost in big state conversations. Because just as we have intense bi biological diversity, we also have intense cultural diversity uh, in this region, and and there's links between those two. You know, you have social ecologies in, in all of these different spaces. Uh, so very much um, it, losing those cultures also means that you lose environmental knowledge 
uh, that you, you lose w ways of interacting with small areas, uh, which the people, I mean, I think it's not right to say that in, uh, uh, in, in earlier times that people had a environmentalist paradigm, but they did have a survivalist paradigm. They didn't want to die. So they didn't do things that were going to destroy where they lived. Right. So there were kind of sustainable practices happening there. Um, so there has to be some way of um, listening to, and, and I can say this, I feel like I've got to say this as an Australian, because we didn't listen, like white settlers came here, we didn't listen, we trashed the place, and now we're like, oh, please, guys, we really need your help. And I, and I can feel like I'm seeing the same sort of things playing out in the Himalaya, where people are coming in from the, uh, uh, from the plains and coming and saying, we know what this is about, you do it this way, and, and ignoring these thousands of years of um, accumulated knowledge of that place, right? So um, it, the 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 cultures are rich, and you know they they help people, and, and it's a, a loss to the earth um, if we lose them. But then there's also this biological, uh, ecological uh, reason to sustain um, cultures as well. They, yeah, and it's um I don't know. There's a it, there there really is a tendency amongst big states to obliterate distinctions. Um, that really, uh, I think we need to push back against. So that's the, so, yeah, cool. yeah. No, I was thinking, I mean, there are two or three things I want to point to because we are, we have, we have more time, but I'm, I'm trying to like uh, also bring the conversation around. But just to say, and I'm looking at the questions again. So a couple of things. First of all, there are various water treaties in existence. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on their effectiveness and how these could be enriched or they could, they could serve as a springboard in order to have this wider conversation. And also what has been the role of like international institutions such as the UN? Have they failed in their mission? Um, have they uh, added to this conversation? Have they moved the conversation forward in the right direction? So these are things that people are wondering uh, about. So I'll take I'll start with Alex, and then we'll, you know, circle the, I would say room, but the um, just to, to start with the to start with the UN. I, uh, international institutions do play some important roles in this region. Ultimately, I think the solution is probably better off coming from below, from the from the people that live in the region, the indigenous groups that that Ruth was talking about, for example. Uh, the, UN, I, the UN is in some ways not that powerful of, of an actor. It's mostly made up of states and states are um, kind of one of the key problem actors in this region, shall we say. So they're very much constrained by, um, by what their constituent members actually want. And in that case, where China has a veto on the Security Council, um, it's very difficult to get things done at that level. You also have groups like ISIMOD, which are try and avoid talking too much about the border conflicts, but do a good job of sharing scientific and information and environmental information around the region. So they, they do some really important work. I think one of the questions was about the Indus Waters Treaty, which was brokered by the World Bank. Um, there are going to have to be treaties to deal with this. Um, something like the Arctic Council or the Antarctic Treaty System would be a better way of managing the ice cap, for example. And that can incorporate Indigenous voices into dealing with, into dealing with the problem. The problem with the existing treaties, and particularly with the Indus Waters Treaty, is that it was written in 1960 and it hasn't been updated. And what it did was divide up the water between India and Pakistan. It's a good example of cooperation, um, but it's also designed to enable the extraction of hydropower and the sort of rationalized use of resources by these states, rather than, um, rather than taking a holistic view of the watershed and governing it. So if we're going to have more treaties, they need to engage with much newer ecological science than the, than the treaties that treat rivers as channels from which to be extracted. Um, so that's the kind of interdisciplinary engagement that we're talking about. Having uh, ecological perspectives, uh, indigenous perspectives, um, and interdisciplinary perspectives fitted into the policy making process. And that's the thing that is, is yet to happen, but it's what needs to happen ultimately. So that's a really interesting question because I think our views of dams 
and hydropower has really changed. I mean, they were considered these incredible feats of, of human engineering um, that managed to, and I mean, every other word we're using is about management as well. So that this also has a, 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 a tone of hubris in it as we think that we're going to manage the weather, manage the ice cap, manage the water, that we're going to control the flow. Um, so even these treaties are a form of, of uh, a sense that you know, we can control our relations and we can control our assets. Uh, we'll divide our assets uh, based on our power and our negotiating uh, powers and abilities. And again, that as a formulation it could be part of the problem. Jayanta, what about institutions? What about this idea of managing, managing the problem moving into the future? Well, I think I will continue with uh, Alex. Uh, we need to update our conceptual framework as we go into handling say 40 year old or 25 year old agreements. Uh, Alex has uh, mentioned the Indus, I mentioned the Faraka, uh, 1975 onwards. It's due for renewal again. But if we leave the whole issue of renewal to the same old conceptual framework and institution, there will be huge problems. But there is uh, not very large process of infusion of what is mentioned as ecological knowledge, interdisciplinary knowledge, before we go for renewal of the agreement between Bangladesh and India on Faraka or India and Pakistan on the Indus Water Treaty or even go into a further agreement between uh, China and India on uh, advanced flood warning. Uh, the issue is that old knowledge system is still driving the new modifications and there is a danger signal. Institutions have to come up with new ideas. We have to absorb global knowledge and uh, without that, there won't be much improvement. For example, the Farakka has been uh, uh, criticized for many things. For example, it shares the water, but it doesn't know how to share the sediment because Himalayan rivers, particularly Ganga, Brahmaputra, Yellow River, Yangtze, the, the, uh, the sediment flows as much as water. Sometimes in Yellow River, you get 200 kgs of sediment in the flood season per thousand liters of uh, water flow. So the agreements only look at the liquid water. In Himalayan rivers, we have the solid water, which is the sediment. Uh, sediment has caused a lot of problem in Faraka. Faraka's storage, Faraka's diversion ability uh, is down and uh, one state, upstream state, Bihar, says that the floods in Bihar are more due to the Farakka Barrage. And what was Bangladesh's demand for a long time that Farakka Barrage should be decommissioned is uh, also a demand from upstream state like uh, Bihar that de decommission Farakka Barrage and we'll have the problem of floods in Bihar solved. So these are uh, indicators that uh, the holistic thinking institutional approach has not yet entered. And uh, I, I think it is high time uh, all of us should push for the interdisciplinary knowledge, institutionally uh, integrated uh, structure and absorption of global knowledge. There is no dearth of good knowledge. There is no dearth of research papers. There is no dearth of uh, high quality publications. There is a problem with infusion of those uh, updated knowledge into the institutions and policy. I think if we can come out with a, a diffusion process of new knowledge in such discussions, that will be very, very useful. 
Thank you. So I'm, I'm hearing new thinking. I'm also hearing that the earth itself is an actor now in IR, something that has not uh, really been uh, taken under consideration. I'm going to ask Alex to respond to that particular part of, of my question. Um, so uh, Deepak, what some of your thoughts? We yeah. have about five minutes before we start wrapping up. Yeah, quickly, because, uh, you know, this uh, question on, uh, you know, UN and international treaties, uh, there's a severe problem there. You know, this excessive focus on blue water, uh, which basically means that you know, and as Jayanta said, Himalayan rivers are also conveyor belts for matter. And Bangladesh and B Bengal and Bihar would not exist today if all that matter hadn't come down from the Himalayas. Okay, you would have had the Tethys Sea geologically. So th that has been completely ignored. Take the Mahakali Treaty signed at the same time, 1996 as the Faraka with India, Bangladesh is dead in the waters, 25 years now, and not even what the treaty said should be done in six months has been done in 25 years. Okay? And why is that? That's primarily because uh, the very name of the treaty and you know, what it proposes to do is there's such a disjuncture. The treaty has a grand title of integrated development of the Makali Basin, but the entire treaty is about building one high dam at Panchaswat. Okay? It doesn't take into account the meteorology. It doesn't take into account the hydrogeology. It doesn't take into account a whole lot of things and including the politics of, you know, uh, resource sharing and shared water between irrigation and hydropower and fisheries and navigation. None of that is there. So one of the big problems with all these international treaties and including the inter UN uh, water course, uh, you know, 1997 thing that has come into force now, but still nobody observes it, is that what, uh, you know, as a cultural theorist, I would say there's too much procedural fetishism. You know, that, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, the bracketed texts and all, if anybody has attended these IPCC things, oh God, climate change, you know, with a full stop and the comma and which goes where without and ignoring the other aspects of the water cycle. You know, and water cannot be dealt with just as blue water. You have to deal with white water. You have to deal with the groundwater. I call it groundwater. You have to deal with green water, the soil moisture water. You know, and you have to deal with uh, a whole lot of gray water that you've got to recycle and reuse, you know, instead of dumping it and sending it down to your neighbor uh, downstream. So most international treaties have not worked uh, for that reason. And there was one question uh, here in the box which said, you know, aren't uh, treaties like the Indus and all that, you know, and all the international treaties like Makali in favor of the upstream? No, on the contrary, it's in favor of the plains. You know, the Indus Treaty completely ignores, for instance, uh, the Kashmiri hills and completely ignores the Sindh Delta fisher folks. It's all about the agricultural central land of Punjab Plains, okay? which is a big thing, okay, politically very central. So there is a big problem with these international treaties for where myopic, uh, you know, blinkers, which has to, which will have to give because Ma Mahakali Treaty should have been by the treaty itself revisited every 10 years. It's 25 years and no statesman has emerged to have the courage, no politician has emerged as a statesman to say, let's revisit it now. Okay, I'm going to have to go to Alex. Alex, I want to hear this idea of Earth as an actor and also combine it with concluding remarks. And then we're going to conclude with Ruth uh, because we are running out of time. Um, yeah, thank you. So what we've talked about here is a clash between how the international political system works and how the ecological watershed works. So I, realist, realist theory or statist approaches to understanding this do to some extent capture the way that India and China are acting. It, that might be how international politics works. I don't really think it is, but it's a simple and popular explanation. Once you take into account though a more holistic view of the watershed and the mountains, the idea of just state to state conflict, you just have to scratch the surface of this and it starts to look quite ridiculous. That's not how this situation is working. It's not in the interest of any of these state actors to destroy the watershed that they rely on. And in particular, that's because of the ecology of the region. That's not something that international relations is interested in, but it should be. If we start to think of the earth and the environment as an actor in the conflict, and I think what we've ultimately said here tonight is that the earth, the Himalaya, the, Himalaya, the cl climate change is ultimately going to undo all of this. It's going to destroy 
the water system, the watershed, the rivers, all of it. That means that the earth is an actor in the conflict. The mountains are alive. They're an agent in the conflict. The, the forests, the trees, the, the people are all part of this. And if we make that conceptual leap, then that's when I think we can start to think about how to fix these problems. Ruth, I think okay. it's time to synthesize yeah, everything so, as we, said. And so we can have our take all together. <laughs> and remember, there are many students who are yes. registered and following this. So we should keep in mind what we're also trying to propose for them. So the first thing I would say, the first key that I think is taking away from what we've got to, all been saying is we need to start thinking about water differently. Water is not just water that we see in a river, right? Rivers seep into the banks. Um, and and the, my favorite one is swamps. I think if we start caring for swamps, like ignore Donald Trump, because we really need to do that anyway. Don't drain the swamps, fill them up. Yeah, care for swamps, right? And if you start thinking about caring for swamps, then your attitude to rivers and water systems changes, right? So go swamps is the first thing. Yeah, um, uh, once we've rethought how rivers and water systems work, um, we then need to build systems that are respectful of uh, those, those systems. Like the states need to be respectful of the systems as opposed to the states trying to make the systems do what they want, right? That's, it's reality. It's real reality as opposed to realism. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is in that process, we have to try and find some way for big states to take, to pay attention to and be respectful of the communities uh, that call this place home, right? This is not just about what the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, big states uh, are looking at this region. It's about listening and respecting the people that see it as home. So those two big things, water is not just blue and this region isn't just a borderland, it's where people live. Um, any final thoughts, Jayanda? Because I'm going to conclude. We have two more minutes before I have to give the, the to conclude the, the webinar. Okay, my, my single point uh, uh, comment will be that uh, you cannot have successful geopolitics without a solid knowledge of ecology. Ecology gives you economic options. Economic options need geopolitics for its materialization, for its success, or otherwise bad geopolitics can do the otherwise. But ecology is very, very important and the geopolitics has to depend on ecology because the topic you have chosen is geopolitics and ecology. I think it will be good to have ecology and geopolitics. Thank you. Deepak, one word. One word. Uh, the future fight uh, for all environmentalists like us is really going to be for water. The whole issue of water footprints and energy footprints. You know, uh, We will have to start focusing on embedded water in all our produce and begin to manage that with proper taxation and things like that. It should not be that, you know, you can import, uh, you know, things from thousands of miles away, spending, you know, lots of water and energy input, and then, you know, throw local production out of business, as is happening with Nepali agriculture, for instance. Okay? So, oh, I, yeah. don't in open another can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, final one thought. Uh, um, I'll just reiterate the, the planet is an actor in the, in the conflict. That's my final okay. thought. Okay, so I want to thank everybody, really. Uh, Ruth, Deepak, Jayanta, Alex, thank you very, very much for this uh, really amazing and hopefully inspiring conversation for everyone. Uh, I think the takeaways, the, the big takeaway is that the earth is an actor, uh, that we need new thinking that we need more of an interdisciplinary thinking, that it cannot only be, uh, we shouldn't understand geopolitics just as these old fashioned securitized uh, geopolitical uh, competitions, uh, that there is much room for cooperation. And that in the sense that, in, in, in the sense that we, ecology has to be part of the new geopolitical thinking. So I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank uh, 
I thank people in the beginning. I want to thank the same people again uh, in closing. I hope uh, that all of you who've joined us today have enjoyed this webinar. It will be posted uh, online uh, later in perhaps in about a week. We will be sending emails thanking everyone for their participation along with some suggested readings for, for those who would like to learn more about the particular research that our panelists are doing or, uh, issue, or readings related to the topic of this panel. Thank you all once again for joining us and uh, we hope to see you again in future uh, discussions that we will be having and hosting under our initiative. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.